Carolyn, we're now live, so we are good to go when you are. Welcome to the Colorado State House District 13 Candidate Forum, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Boulder County. My name is Carolyn Cutler. I am a proud member of the League, and I am pleased to serve as moderator for tonight's forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. In 2020, we are celebrating 100 years of encouraging informed and active participation in government, influencing public policy through education and advocacy on a wide range of issues. To remain nonpartisan, the League never supports or opposes politi political candidates or parties. Our candidate forums are typically held in person with the moderator candidates, volunteers, and audience members all in one place, but to observe public health best practices, we're participating online. According to the FCC, candidate forums must be broadcast in their entirety, except by media reporting on events. Candidates or their staff are, not, are asked not to record this forum. However, it will be made available online for public viewing through election day. The Colorado House of Representatives is comprised of 65 representatives. Representatives are elected every two years in the district from in which they live, and they are limited to serving eight consecutive years. Each representative district consists of approximately 77,500 citizens. District 13 covers the city of Boulder, primarily west of Broadway, and extends west to include Jamestown, Ward, and Netherland. The format for tonight's forum will be as follows. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement. We will then begin with questions which have been submitted electronically online by the community to the league. Questions have been, been reviewed by our League of Women Voters volunteer screeners and will be addressed to all candidates. I will ask the candidates as many questions as time permits. Each candidate will have up to one minute and in some cases 90 seconds to answer the question. As the moderator, I will announce the time allowed to answer the questions. Our timekeeper will help you stay on track. We will finish with one minute closing statements. Tonight's forum participants include in, in, in ballot order, Republican Kevin Sippel, Democrat Judy Amabile, Libertarian James E. Jed Gilman. Now to the opening statements. Again, unless otherwise noted, each candidate will have one minute to respond. Please watch for the timekeeper's signal at the 15 second mark. And when your time is up, please stop. If you are mid-sentence when your time is up, please promptly finish that sentence so we can move on to the next candidate. For the opening statements, we will begin with candidate Sippel. My name is and Kevin Sippel. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Am I okay? You're good. Um, my name is Kevin Sippel, and and House District 13 is actually quite large for a House district. Most of them are less than a county in size, and ours happens to be the better part of five counties. Uh, besides Boulder County, it's Gilpin County, Clear Creek County, Jackson County, and Grand County. And um, the reason I decided to go for it is... Um, that for for several times before uh, for several seasons election seasons no one uh, no Republicans would go for this district and the reason is is because the city of Boulder is fairly heavy with Democrats and uh, they have a tendency to be able to pull the district one way or the other I uh, consider that. Um, that the government is uh, there to protect our rights, to make our own decisions and to do what we want, uh, run our lives as we see fit, not to help us run it or to tell us what to do or to make demands or protect itself. It's uh, there to protect our rights to keep doing what we wanna do and then protect our safety. And uh, I see some lacks in that, in what's going on these days. And that's why I'm running to try and do something about it. Thank you. Candidate Amabile. 
Hi, I'm Judy Amabile, and I'm a Democrat running for House District 13. I am um, moved to Colorado when I was 12 years old, came to Boulder in 1971 to go to college, and I've pretty much been here ever since. I am a mother, I am a business person, and I care deeply about our climate and environment. Um, my campaign is around those three issues climate change and the environment, uh, helping to lift up working people. We learned from running our business that working people in Colorado are really having a tough time making it here and that there are a lot of things that could be done to make their lives better. And I wanna work on that. And then finally, I wanna address the appalling lack of mental health resources in our state. I have a son with schizophrenia, bipolar, and co-occurring substance misuse disorder. And he just has not been able to get the kind of help that he needs to recover. And I wanna work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you. I, want to, I need to introduce myself, I suppose. I was uh, raised in the Midwest on a, in a rural community and uh, came to Colorado in 1983. Um, I've been a blue collar guy for 33 years and uh, seven year army veteran throughout my career, both militarily and in the private sector, I've been promoted and advanced uh, ahead of my peers with minimum time in grade and minimum time in services in those occupations. I've also been selected by my peers. Um, it's a union uh, represented shop and I've, and I've been selected in multiple roles up to and including local president uh, for our work uh, place. So I'm not afraid to, uh, to take on administrative roles or take on tough tasks in negotiating contracts or representing, uh, uh, representing my peers. Um, I am a libertarian, obviously I stand for minimalist government. So uh, giving back more to the people of what they earn and letting them keep it and make decisions on how it's used is my, Time's up. Uh, my goal. Thank you. Thank you. And for the first question, we will start with candidate Amabile. Given the current racial inequities and tensions, what can you do to create discussions and effective problem solving to address systemic racism across our state? Thank you for the question. Yeah, I think everything we do as a matter of policy has to be seen through the lens of equity. So how do we make sure that everything we're doing is about lifting people up and about addressing inequity in our society. So some of the areas that I'm very interested in working on, first of all, solving or addressing income inequality and bringing the people who are at the bottom of the income scale up. And we do that through things like uh, living wage, paid family leave, uh, access to banking, access to capital, um, the second thing uh, I think we have to do is look at all of the ways that our criminal justice system is discriminating against people of color, against people with mental illness, and against people who don't have a lot of money. And so I think that's the second big area that I would want to focus on. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think first we need to look at what information's get, getting put out there and the validity of it all. True, there are inequities in society and there is inequities in treatments. I, I know people who have faced uh, 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 prejudice when, as soon as they get pulled over because of their skin color. But I think empowering the individuals themselves lifts people up and allows them to feel more like they're part of a community. And then I think the others around them are reflective of that by the same allowance and empowerment to then make better choices. I believe in the American spirit. I believe in the American people that if they're not pressured 15. by the enrollment of big government, that people make the right choices. So 
uh, I don't believe in defunding a police force, but I do believe in maybe educating them a little better on how to handle situations if, if uh, it arises. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Sippel. I believe that uh, equity is important, but not equity of outcome. We can't guarantee everyone is going to live in a fancy house or drive a nice car, but we can guarantee that they all have the chance to do that if they want to work hard and work towards that. Um, it's um, right now there we're being um, we're being basically doused with uh, media telling us how, uh, how terrible the racial situation is, how uh, racist we all are, how divided we all are. What we need, I think, is to stop talking about that, to stop having Black Americans and Hispanic Americans and um, Asian Americans and just have Americans. It can work. And um, that would be the the best way to start soothing things and and fixing them, I believe. Thank you. For the second question, we will start with candidate Gilman. Please share your thoughts on the threat of climate change. Is the state doing enough or should it do more to prevent the impacts of climate change to people and our environment? Okay, thank you. Well, I'll, uh, another introduction. I'm in the oil industry, so I'm not an unbiased uh, person on that into, on that aspect. But I will say that yes, environment is an issue. I, that we are working, and we should continue to strive for. And the industry that I'm in condones that and and respects that, and knows that we need we can't live on fossil fuels for the, the rest of the time the planet Earth is going around the sun, and uh, so. Uh, I don't have, I don't know what the right answer is, but I do believe that we are moving in the right direction. I think uh, I started in the industry. There was no EPA, there was no um, OSHA, and there's a lot of changes that have come out of the government programs that have been implemented. And I think just continuing on that path is the right path. Thank you. Candidate Sippel. Okay, um, I actually um, believe in solar power and wind power, and uh, we are moving towards um, making it a more useful method of power. It is more expensive. Um, my company, the, um, the company I worked for for 31 years, we, went, we bought into the first wind power that was available in Colorado, which were the big wind towers up near the Wyoming border and past Greeley. Uh, and it was more expensive. We did it for marketing purposes so we could say our water was bottled with uh, natural wind power. Um, uh, fossil fuels are still very important because there's no way wind or solar power can get us through now. All you have to do is look at what's happening in California lately with their blackouts and brownouts and all the trouble they're having keeping the power grid going. Um, someday there will be enough battery storage to go through three windy days or, or a snow or a five day blizzard with no sun to make power with electric. Um, I'll just stop. Thank you. Candidate Amavale. Um, so yeah, the question, how, are we doing enough? Is the government doing enough? Do we have a real problem? Yes, the government's not doing enough. We do have a real problem. Uh, progress is being made, but we need to do more and we do need to do it more quickly. Uh, we can see it this year with the fires that we have, we have been under a cloud of smoke here in Boulder. And imagine if you lived even closer to one of these fires, what a dystopian summer you would have had and then there's drought. And that's some evidence that we can feel right here in Colorado. So I have a climate plan and it's available on my website. And in that climate plan, I'd lay out how we have to make a transition to clean energy. Then we have to electrify our transportation. We have to electrify our homes. And then we have to make a just transition to a clean economy so that the people who have been hurt by the boom and bust cycles of the extraction industries are, take it, are protected either by providing other kinds of economic vitality into those communities or by um, job training, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
For the third question, we will start with candidate Sippel. What types of state activities do you think are most important to help decrease the rate of COVID infections and help in COVID recovery? Well, um, I'm a believer that um, we're past the point where the serious lockdowns are, are accomplishing what they're supposed to. Masks are okay. I mean, uh, we can all live with putting on masks, but um, the, the lockdowns, the closing of schools, the being isolated, it's causing a lot of uh, mental health issues in our country. Uh, the, um, the, the, suicide, the national suicide hotline, suicide calls are up 338%. Um, the FDA has declared Zoloft as a, a popular antidepressant, um, a, a, a shortage drug. They can't get enough of it anymore. Uh, a third of all people are, are having trouble sleeping, having trouble eating. Uh, it's causing a lot of issues. And now, as of three days ago, even the World Health Organization has come out and said that they no longer believe that the lockdowns are the right way to go. The states that never locked down are doing better than we are now. And I'll just stop there. Okay, thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got in agreement with Kevin on this, but uh, even to an excess of that, uh, I believe it was extreme government overreach from the start. My, my concern is we were led to believe that millions and millions of people were gonna die. It's a, true, it's a bad virus, but what really has died is businesses and jobs and incomes and family lifestyles. So uh, the initial reaction was unknown, but I think now we know we have evidence and I think it's time to loosen the restrictions, allow people to use their own common sense, which is what I'm about anyway. I'm about individual choice mostly, but uh, let the businesses and let the individuals decide how they best are gonna handle moving okay. forward from here. Uh, winter's coming, they can't eat on the sidewalks all winter. So we need to look at realistic uh, ways to move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. For the next question, the league has invited a representative. Wait, Judy of didn't get to speak. Oh, okay, I am very sorry. Candidate Amabile. Okay. So um, I believe we have a health crisis and we have an economic crisis and we have to solve those two things in tandem. And um, so on the health crisis, masks, social distancing, testing, contact tracing, those things are all really important. We saw here at CU that we had a giant spike in cases and we responded by saying, okay, we've got to shut these parties down. We've got to keep these kids distanced and very quickly, within two weeks, the number of cases came right back down. So it works and we have to keep doing that. And then in terms of the economic crisis, yes, we have to do everything we can to keep our businesses open. And I think very importantly, we have to keep people in their homes. So we have to, we have to support tenants who are having trouble making their rent. We have to support landlords who are not going to be able to make their mortgage payments. We have to support homeowners who won't be able to make their mortgage payments. And there are a lot of smart ways we can go about that. And that is how I think we're going to get through this crisis with the least amount of damage. Thanks. Thank you. For the next question, we will start with candidate Amabile. The League has invited a representative of Safe House Progressive Alliance for Nonviolence also known as SPAN. Here to represent SPAN is Ann Tapp. We will give the candidates 90 seconds for the response and start with candidate Amabile. Ann, please go ahead with your submitted question. Thank you, Carolyn, and, and uh, good evening, candidates. Um, as you know, as you can imagine, the COVID-19 crisis has had particular impact on marginalized communities. And that's certainly been the case for survivors of domestic violence. Um, oftentimes survivors are uh, faced with the untenable choice of remaining with an abusive partner or facing homelessness for themselves and their children. What legislative priorities would you put in place to address the issue of affordable housing and childcare uh, for our communities? 
Yeah, this is clearly a big issue. And um, my own uh, son has experienced homelessness. And so I, I definitely understand how dramatic the situation is. And we have to put funding towards building affordable housing. So affordable housing that's affordable to people in marginalized communities, we have to pay for that. We have to figure out what are we gonna do to put money into that um, endeavor. Uh, for other kinds of housing, I think we have to work on our zoning so that more housing can be built for working families so that they can actually afford that housing. And then in terms of people who um, are facing domestic violence, and have no other options, we obviously have to beef up our social safety net. And that has really suffered in the last many years. We're not providing the kinds of mental health care we need. We don't have the kind of supportive housing that we need. We don't have the kind of wraparound services that we need. Children who grow up in homes that, where there's violence need mental health care supports and they need that throughout their life, not just at the moment when their family is in crisis. And so it is a funding issue, but it's also a putting our will to it issue and having the kind of compassion that we need to have to make sure that the least among us are being taken care of. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you. And I'll admit that I'm not experienced in this uh, subject, but uh, I do believe that I don't know where all the money comes from to continue to throw at the programs, except where uh, society is allowed to make the priorities in the, the demographic of their own area. I know uh, uh, rec centers, uh, churches, organizations that uh, see a need tend to step forward when uh, the requirements there. Uh, I don't believe that government can solve all of our problems. I don't believe that government is the answer to everything, but I do think when the individual sees that they have an opportunity to make a choice and make a good choice, that they will then allow the resources that have been uh, liberated from government control into their own pockets to move forward to build boys and girls clubs to start uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scout uh, troops, to those, those sorts of things that also then take active roles, voluntarily participate in the needs of the uh, society that they are uh, 15. within. So I, I, don't, I, I don't know where money comes from. Just It's come from the COVID to pay for everybody. I just don't know where that's all coming from. So Give it back to the people, let them make the choices. Thank you. Candidate Sipple. Okay, I have a little experience in this avenue. Uh, one of my volunteer positions, my last one, has actually lasted quite long. I've been a, a victim advocate with the Boulder Sheriff's Office since 2001, and I still am. Um, there are a lot of people in government working towards this problem. Uh, the the ANTAPS organization SPAN is a really good one. There's another really excellent one up in Longmont. Um, there's, uh, the, and the problem is larger now because of the COVID crisis. Uh, because of, of a lot of kids not being in school, the teachers can't, uh, catch wind when they're being abused at home and this and that. So there is a lot more child abuse. There's a lot more um, domestic violence going on right now. It's actually significantly more. I don't know the exact percentages, but it's significantly more. And um, I, I believe as James does that we can't tax ourselves into curing all the problems of the government. Um, but uh, there's a lot of people working on it, a lot of good people, and we can we just have to continue that. Uh, we need some more programs. We need the COVID crisis to be over so we can start moving back towards a normal uh, situation. As far as uh, affordable housing goes, there's some actual inequities in uh, affordable housing that you might call financial scams, uh, which I'm afraid I just don't have enough time to tell talk. Okay. Thank you. 
For the fifth question, we will start with candidate, candidate Gilman. As gun violence continues, not only in our country, but also in Colorado, what do you propose we do to de decrease the number of violent events, yet protect a person's right to own a gun legally? Well, that's a very good question. I, first of all, I am a hunter. I am a, a firearms owner and I opposed the uh, red flag legislation as uh, uh, no due process. So that said, uh, I don't know what's co the cause of the gun violence. Uh, I don't think defunding police departments would be the answer though, however. Um, I don't know where the, the systemic uh, violence is coming from, but I do think when you allow people in the streets rioting and destructive behavior and you don't do anything about it, I think that condones that sort of behavior, which lead, would then lead to more of that kind of aggressive action. So I think uh, people need to put <laughs> their feet down sometimes to, uh, to take authority and take control of a bad situation. Look at Portland. 15. Okay, Thank I'm you. good. That's that's it. Okay, candidate Sipple. Okay, I I also am a gun owner and uh, support the Second Amendment. Um, people have to have the right to defend themselves. The government cannot do it. Um, I, someone's breaking into your house. You can sure you can call the police, and they'll take maybe 11 minutes to get there. They can be there pretty quick, but not as soon as you need them to be there. Uh, and when you're protecting a family, you need to be able to do that. Uh, I also um, the general level of um, lawlessness that's being allowed right now and actually supported by our government is the wrong way to do it. Uh, allowing uh, people to run rampant, tear down statues, even of President Lincoln, and, um, uh, and go wild, burn things, and shoot each other. Uh, it's just the wrong way to do it. And um, we have to, as a society, we have to start thinking of law and order as kind of a more important thing, a bargain with each other to keep each other safe. Thank you. Candidate Amabile. Hi, yeah, thanks for the question. So um, I, I actually testified in favor of the red flag uh, law as a common sense way of providing families an avenue to stop their loved one. My, my son wanted to get a gun and kill himself and we had to go to the gun shop and beg the gun shop owner not to sell him the gun, which they were very nice and they agreed not to do, but we shouldn't be in, that shouldn't be our only option to stop a suicide. I think we should have gun safes so that people have to lock up their firearms if they have kids in their homes. There should be a waiting period to buy guns so that somebody who's making an impetuous decision to go out and commit suicide is slowed down. And I think we should have an assault weapons ban because these are not used for hunting or for protecting your family. Um, I think we have to address the underlying causes of violence and that is looking at our mental health supports looking at income inequality and understanding this school to prison pipeline that we've created in our country. We have to address those things. Thank you. The sixth question, we will begin with candidate Sippel. What do you feel state government should do to address the mental and behavioral health needs in our community and across Colorado? Well, first of all, we just met our, our state government just made the active decision to cut a lot of mental health funding out. Um, the uh, all kinds of programs in each of the counties at like our sheriff's department and our DA's office, they both have restorative justice programs where they're kind of community justice uh, setups where the offender will get with the uh, victim and a group of community people and some professionals in there and they talk about it and they make the offender see the error of his ways. They've cut a lot of the funding for that program just recently, whereas they're keeping funding for things like the fast tracks program the the 4.7 billion dollar train system that's going to get trains from arvada to loveland 
and won't even be working until 2050. It's time for us to use some common sense in the way we spend our money and spend it on useful things. There's all kinds of programs in the jails that have stopped being funded. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Candidate Amabile. Hi, yeah, I think um, we are spending a lot of money in Colorado on mental health care and we're not spending it well. And um, part of the problem is that there are, the funding is fractured. It comes from all different places and the providers then have to answer to all different funding sources and spend a whole lot of time on administration, administrative tasks when the money would be better spent serving people. So I think we need to streamline the funding. We need to create mental health districts that are, are lined with communities. We need to make sure that part of what we're doing is creating the things that are unique to mental illness. Things like creating supportive housing and wraparound services, helping people with medication monitoring. And um, these things are not, don't lend themselves to a fee for service model. So these things we have to provide in, on a different kind of basis. And in Boulder, our um, system is run by private insurance. That's a mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think we are spending a lot of money. I, I, I think the problem is that maybe we're not reviewing evaluation of how effective it's, it's it, where the money's going and how effective it is. Things like, I don't agree with condoning drug use by creating a safe injection site. I just think that empowers people to stay addicted. So are we spending our monies that we're spending in the right areas? And are we doing the effective programs? Maybe we need to have an oversight uh, uh, panel to evaluate what's going on. And I'd like to, I, fiscal responsibility is tough, but you have to live within it. I have to live within it. We all have to live within it. We just can't keep throwing money. So let's evaluate what's going on. Let's see what's most effective. Let's see okay. where the money can be spent uh, more wisely. Thank you. Thank you. For the seventh question, we will start with candidate Amabile. If elected, how would you work to build understanding and collaboration among mem members of your political party and those from other political parties and affiliation affiliations? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I am probably not a moderate and certainly not on this panel, um, but I am a pragmatist. I've spent 25 years running a business. I understand that you have to give a little to get a little. And I absolutely plan to work with my colleagues across the aisle and with people within my own caucus who have different points of view on different issues. Um, I've been invited if I'm elected to join a, a group of five Republicans and five Democrats at the state house uh, to be, to, to create a bipartisan uh, coalition. 95% of the bills that were passed last session at the legislature were bipartisan. So there's a little bit of a myth that there is no collaboration, there is. And what we hear about are the really contentious bills that do go down in a party line vote, but the majority of the legislation that's being passed is on a bipartisan basis. And I, I plan to continue in that vein. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you. So that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty uh, uh, appropriate question for me. As a third party candidate, uh, I feel, and the reason I am a third party candidate, I I voted for Reagan, but I was a registered Democrat for 22 years. I, I felt the divide that I think a lot of other people within the country are witnessing and seeing of the polarization. And so uh, the, the United States government is built with a three, three par, uh, uh, legislative, executive, and uh, judicial branches as, as a tempering and as, as a balance. And so I think the polarization of the two-party system has outlived its own effectiveness. So getting a third party, a legitimate third party in there with uh, non-extreme values, but basically constitutional 
back to the fundamental values, I think is the way to go. And so I'm here to try to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate, candidate Sipple. Okay, um, I believe that um, the the people at the, the legislature can work together. Not only can they, but I think they already do. We're told by um, all the news we hear that they're fighting like cats and dogs all the time, both in Congress, in Washington, and at our legislature. And uh, from what I've seen and people I've talked to, that just isn't true. Um, they get along a lot better than we're told they do. And uh, I would uh, keep that going. You sure um, don't get anything by fighting with people. And everyone really wants the best for the people of the state. And we're all willing to work with other people for it. In fact, we better be willing to work with other people because that's the only way to get along in the world. Thank you. The next question goes to candidate Gilman. Starts with candidate Gilman. What would you insist we Coloradans and the state legislature do to improve the economy for everyone? Uh, well, first of all, I would, uh, I would lift some of the restrictions that have been imposed on us. Uh, I've said before, it was, I, I feel like it was an overreach, extreme overreach. So allow people to open up their businesses, allow the, the, why is Home Depot a, 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 inf a critical infrastructure, but mom and pop shop down the street that has a little grocery uh, counter not? Why are the big corporations being allowed to maintain their business, but the local and the most critical businesses are not? So I would demand that we start lifting up the restrictions. I live in Gilpin County. The casinos are doing just fine because they were allowed to, to lift up. I don't see a lot of social distancing there. So okay. if it's good there, why isn't it good at uh, the, the mom and pop pizza shop down the road? Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Sippel. Um, I'd have to agree with most of that. It's, it is time to open our economy back up. It's, uh, you, you can't blame anybody for being alarmed when, the, when all this COVID crisis first started. No one knew what it was going to be like. No one knew that it wasn't going to be the end of the world in a science fiction movie, but it wasn't. And uh, to go every, every 30 days and put another 30-day emergency period back on and, um, and keep people locked down, locked in their houses, um, going crazy, um, going broke. And um, our human, the human beings can live with that. We've been living with uh, bacteria and viruses for only about 75,000 years. Uh, we can sure learn to live with it again. If we, if we knuckle under every time there's something like this goes on, and this, this I believe, did come from China, we're going to start seeing a new virus every year from China because they, they almost beat us in this. Thank you. Candidate Amabile. Okay, I understood the question to be more generally about how we improve uh, the economy. And this, I have an economic plan on my website. And um, for me, the, the place where we start is making sure that pe working people have what they need to get ahead. So no one should work full time and not be able to support themselves and have a place to live and have enough to eat. So we need to have living wages. We need to have decent benefits. We need fair rules on things like overtime. We need access to affordable housing, affordable transit. We need access to a high quality education. And that might be a community college education, an apprenticeship program, or, or a four-year college degree. But that has to be accessible and affordable for everybody. Then we also need to make sure that people have access to savings, that they can, um, they can participate in our banking system, and then to create generational wealth that people can become homeowners and create wealth for their family. Those are just a few things that are in my economic plan. Thank you. The next question, for the next question, we will start with candidate Sippel. Affordable health care continues to be a concern for many Coloradans. 
what would you do to ensure that everyone who needs affordable medical coverage gets it? Well, for one thing, um, no one gets turned away in an emergency room. Uh, there, it's the they, they'll take anybody on, but someone might just not pay the bill. Uh, hospitals get have all kinds of unpaid bills that go on every year. Hospitals and doctors and this and that. Uh, but uh, what I would do is something that maybe most Republicans wouldn't. I would keep the basic structure of what we call Obamacare in place. The actual mechanics of it. The um, the financial part, the uh, the organization of it, but I would also increase uh, drastically the amount of uh, market condition uh, and um, competition in that. Um, uh, we also need a lot more clarity, and I guess uh, what they call I can't think of the word. Uh, uh, it's it's when uh, you can actually know what's going on when we when there's nothing being hidden from us. But anyway, we need to be able to know how much it's going to cost to go into a, hopper, a hospital for a hernia operation. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you, candidate Amabile. Yeah. So, not surprisingly, I have a healthcare plan on my website, which I would encourage people to take a look at. Um, I think basically we need to make sure that everyone has access to affordable health care. The least affordable way to provide health care is through emergency rooms. We need to provide preventative care and primary care and care for our children. And everybody has to have access. So we have programs in place that we have to make sure we keep. We have to make sure we keep our Medicaid program intact and the CHIP program, the Children's Health Program. We have to allow, I think we should allow more people to buy into Medicaid. Right now, if you're on disability, you can buy into Medicaid, but we should allow more people to buy into the Medicaid plan uh, through Connect for Health Colorado. I think our reinsurance program that uh, the governor implemented or in the legislature is, is good and it's doing well. And then the other thing I think we need to do is decouple health insurance from employment. We saw in this pandemic that People lost their jobs and then they lost their health insurance. We have to stop doing that. And I have a plan for, for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Okay, thank you again. I, as, as a union member, I have health care, And as a, I think company sponsored health plans are, are effective and, but they're not available to everybody. But uh, there are other options out there as, as a, uh, candidate uh, as uh, Kevin spoke about earlier there nobody's turned away from a emergency room visit so that's a credit to our society as a whole but there's other programs besides just corporate uh, health insurance providers MediShare is one that I know of that's a good example of a way to lessen your own expenses for uh, insurance big insurance companies aren't the way to go but again Give people back some of their own money. Quit taxing everybody to death. Let them have a little more money in their pocket. And then they can choose where they okay. want to go. Give them choices to how best to spend their money on their health care. And let them do that and empower them back. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, we will start with candidate Amabile. House Bill 2011-80, which was postponed indefinitely during the 2020 legislative session, would have required regulations for use of pesticides to, sorry, to pollinate, oh, would have required regulations for the use of pesticides that are harmful to pollinator insects. Would you support this bill if reintroduced in 2021? Why or why not? Sorry. Um, yes, I would support that bill. We absolutely have to be regulating the things that are causing environmental harm and causing harm to people on the planet and, and animals and vegetation. Um, we, we also have to get at the, the the chemical that is in fire retardants that's being sprayed all over our mountain communities and poisoning the wells. And we need stricter regulation. And then for the people whose wells have been contaminated, we need to help those people get access to clean water. Clean water, clean air, 
these are the basics of human survival. And we have to figure out a better way of putting ourselves here in the planet in alignment with the natural order of things. And we haven't done a good job of that. And we have to make sure that we address that. So yes, I would support that, absolutely. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Hi, of course, that's, that's a no-brainer. I would support that in a minute. Uh, there, there are natural uh, ecosystem answers to pest control. Pest, chemical pesticides are, are polluting our planet and we're, we know killing the bees, the bees don't pollinate then our, I don't know why there's even a discussion on it, frankly. Um, some social programs need to be uh, endorsed and I would, I would stand behind that 100%. Thank you. Candidate Sippel. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that specific bill, and it would depend what it said in it, to, whether I uh, support it or not. How I do, however, support uh, uh, removing certain pesticides from our use. I'm guessing they were talking about a pesticide called neonicotinoids, which is what's most suspected in killing the bees. I actually happen to be a beekeeper and have a hive right out behind my house here. Um, it's uh, right now, there's some pesticides, that being one of them, that uh, are even legal to use on organic crops. There's uh, 12 of them that are legal to use on organic crops. And everyone thinks if they buy organic, they're not getting any pesticides. And that's just not true. Uh, the only uh, pe the only an herbicide that uh, they can't use is Roundup, and as we know now, Roundup is killing a lot of people and a lot of things, uh, including a lot of bees. But uh, so I support clean water and clear, and removing some of the bad pesticides and neonicotinoids are really bad. Thank you. The next question will begin with um, candidate Gilman, youth homelessness is an ongoing challenge in our community. What actions or policies do you feel could best prevent homelessness and help youth, homeless youth become safely and stably housed? <laughs> well, I don't have a plan for that. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, underlying social uh, issues that are leading to that, of course, uh, abuse, uh, uh, spousal abuse, and and uh, child abuse; uh, those need to be addressed. What is the right answer to that? I don't know. I have to do some. I'd have to study that. But uh, the uh, there's a divorce rate. Uh, single parent families, uh, kids are left latchkey kids all the time. They don't have any place to go. Again, that might be another uh, opportunity to uh, develop. Uh, boys and girls clubs, uh, social areas that the kids can go to when the parent is required to be at work or work in two jobs to try to take care of them. Maybe we could look at the family structure and try to rebuild that first. Then when the, if that's not effective, then at least go to what other options are out there. They're available, but we need to prioritize them. Thank, Thank you. you. Candidate Sippel. Well, um, there's, there are um, a lot of things we can do. One thing in general is I think we need to start trying to get our, all of our social functions uh, geared towards building uh, families back up. Um, the family structure is sort of lacking in modern times. We move towards more progressive things with the government being more in charge of everything, in charge of what the kids learn uh, when they learn it. And um, old fashioned, what we might call American family values are being stressed less than they ever were. Church, uh, church going is, um, is less prominent than it used to be. And in fact, as a government, we're trying to discourage churches. Uh, even in the COVID crisis, you can't go to church. You can go riot, or I mean peaceful protest, but you can't go to church. So we need to start building some social mores back up in our country. Thank you. Candidate Amabile. Yeah, I mean, homeless youths is a 
<clears throat> it's something as a society we should really all be ashamed of that we are allowing young kids to live on the street because we don't want to provide the resources that are needed to make sure that they're well taken care of. And I think programs like Attention Homes that serves youth 18 to 23 and provides them housing, we have to do more of that. That is absolutely our moral obligation. Um, we do have to address the root causes. We have to have, make sure we have mental health supports. We have to make sure that families and single parents as well have access to economic opportunity. We have to provide drug treatment and not stigmatize drug addiction as a, a character flaw, but rather as an illness. And we have to support our LGBTQ youth, a lot of whom are the ones that end up homeless because their families reject them because of who they are and who they love. And we have to stop doing that. Thank you. For our last question, we'll begin with candidate Sippel. How would you help to protect our open spaces and to increase the acreage throughout our state? Uh, well, we can uh, be careful about uh, our zoning laws and not actually open a bunch of uh, empty spaces up for um, development. There actually is a lot of that, even in Boulder County, even right around Boulder in some of the fields. There's um, a lot of fighting going on right now in the Twin Lakes uh, district, just east of Boulder, because um, because the Boulder County, who actually owned those properties, refused to turn them into open space and wanted to sell them for um, for medium income housing development. Um, <clears throat> These were totally natural places where the water table was a foot under the surface. They would have been a terrible place to build anything and people are still working on it. Um, we also have to be careful where we allow people to build in the mountains because people are building all around all these uh, forested areas that someday are going to burn and people are gonna die protecting those houses. Thank you. Candidate Amabile. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question? Yes. How would you help to protect our open spaces and to increase the acreage throughout our state? Yeah, so I think we have to conserve more of our wild places and we have to protect more of our wild places from resource extraction, from oil and gas, from mining, from uh, deforestation. And um, so I think that's, that's a really important piece. And then in our cities and towns, yeah, I think it's great how much open space we have and we have to make sure we take care of that, um, that space and we have to make sure we're good stewards of the land. And I think we've done a terrific job of that in Boulder. And we also have to open up areas that like we have done here in Boulder for, for recreation so that we create more people who become passionate about the outdoors. I made my living um, in the outdoor industry. And once you get somebody exposed to how incredibly beautiful these natural places are, once somebody sees a bear out in the wild, they become stewards. And so we have to do more of that and more education with our youth. Thank you. Candidate Gilman. Well, I think we all live in Colorado for all the same reasons. So I think all three of us uh, understand the value of keeping the open spaces and keeping the wild areas wild. And so smart development, uh, population growth has, has really impacted everything. And have we done everything we can? I, th I, think, I think generally Colorado has done a good job with the resources that they've had available to them. Um, my biggest hero in the history of the United States is Teddy Roosevelt. And I loved what he did with the national park system. And uh, so I think funding more in the, the open space and the, you know, the, the park services would allow them to be able to do the environmental studies, to be able to see what the smart development could look like and then use their expertise to base on our, our path forward. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now it is time for our closing statements. For this portion, each candidate will have one minute for closing statement, and we will begin with candidate Amabile. Well, I want to say thank you to the league for putting on this forum. It's just, and thank you to Kevin and to James for coming. And um, it's just a great opportunity to, to, and to all of you people who are watching and um, who are looking at the video afterwards. Um, I'm going to the State House because I really believe that my life experiences have put me in a position to do a good job at the legislature advocating for a better environment for working families and for better health care services, particularly mental health care services. I am not a moderate, but I am a pragmatist and I'm going to the state house if you elect me to work on these issues and to make real change happen. And um, I'd love to have your vote and thank you again. And again, it's Judy Amabile and you can go to my website at judyamabile.com. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Gilman, your closing statement, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to meet uh, the other two candidates. Um, again, as a libertarian, I'm, I'm minimalist government. So I wanna run, I want to give individuals back their own choices in their own lives. So if you elect me to represent you, I will do that in a manner that will empower you. And I think that will allow some of the other social issues to be addressed. Now, yeah, call me naive if you want to. And I've heard people say that, but I do believe in the American spirit and the American culture. I have the opportunity to lead. I've led in the military. I've led in the union environment. So I can get the job done. Um, and so I appreciate the, the chance of the league to, to allow me to come on here and express my points of view. Uh, the United States is a, is a republic, and I, uh, I, I embrace that, and I embrace the Constitution. So fundamentally, go back to the, the basics. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Sippel, your closing statement. Um, I also embrace the Constitution and will do my best to keep it, just no matter what. It's the reason America is such a good place. Uh, America was the first society ever to try something like a r removing slavery. I know there's a lot of stories about that now, but it's true. America was the first country in the history of human race to try that. I've been doing public service, what I consider public service, since 1992 when I got when I started my first volunteer thing at the social services and appointed board. Uh, continue with the last tw almost 20 years in the sheriff's office, and I can't even bring myself to leave that because it's uh, so kind of rewarding. Um, I. Um, I consider uh, going to the state house and working in the legislature as a continuation of my public service. None of us are planning to go there to get rich. So that's it. That's why I want to be there. And I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates. On behalf of the league, I want to thank all of our candidates, not only for your participation in tonight's forum, but also for your participation in the democratic process, running for office, and serving as an elected official. It's hard work and we really appreciate your efforts. I also want to give thanks to League Candidate Forum volunteers who are working really hard this year, including the League's Invaluable Operations Director, Mandy Nuku, Elizabeth Crow, our, our co-president, Josephine Porter and Peggy Leach. This forum will be available for viewing. Please go to the League's website lwvbc.org for the link. I'm going to say that again, lwvbc, as in League of Women Voters, Boulder County. And finally, thanks to the Boulder County voters for participating <laughs> as viewers tonight. Um, it's up to all of us to make sure we respect and work to protect our democratic processes. Too many people have suffered and succeeded in the struggle to win these rights for us not to use them. It starts with being an informed and active voter to check out other important issues affecting our community, check out our League Voter Information website, vote411.org for all the election information you need. 
The League of Women Voters of Boulder County works throughout the year to help empower voters and defend democracy. If you want to lend your time and skills to encourage civic engagement for all people in a nonpartisan manner, please join us. All the information you need is at www.lwvbc.org. Thank you very much for attending um, and, and or watching. Have a great evening. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.